Okay, I'll start. So I'm Dana Robinson. I am the director of software engineering at the HDF Group. I've been at the company for about 13 years now, since 2009. I've been working on the library for a long time. So um, we're talking about the the roadmap and some new features. There we go. Um, talk about the, the release schedule. Um, we'll talk about the virtual object layer, which technically isn't new, but it's really arriving in a much more finished form now. Um, the Onion VFD, uh, VFD Swimmer, and HDF5 and 2.0, what we're planning on doing in the future, um, or at least the discussion of it. Um, so HDF5 release schedule. So this is on GitHub now. Uh, this is current as of today. Um, you can see on here, we have we have the, the 1.8 branch, the 1.10, 1.12, and 1.13 branches. Uh, we'll be trying to end up the development of 1.8 and 1.12 at the end of this year. Um, this will probably be retired early in the new year. Uh, 114 will release probably not in December, probably in November. We have two more releases of 113. We have 113.2 and 113.3. 113.2, I delayed uh, a month so we could get subfiling out a little bit early. It's important for the access scale computing project. So we wanted to get that out a little earlier rather than later. And then we'll have another feature that comes out later in, in 113.3. So the, the features that are coming. Uh, so 113.2 is going to have selection I.O. in it. That's vector I.O. at the VFD level, virtual file driver level. So that's not really user visible. Um, the Onion VFD, which is versioned HDF5 files, and we'll talk about that a little bit here. Um, then the VFD swimmer feature, which is an improved swimmer feature. Uh, Subfiling, which is an ECP parallel HDF5 feature. That's I.O. concentrators in parallel HDF5 allows you to kind of find a happy medium between file per process and single shared file. And then in 113.3, we'll have the multi data set IO feature, which allows IO operations that span multiple data sets. It's more of a parallel HDF5 feature. Um, one of the things that I should reiterate is the difference between experimental and maintenance releases. And starting with 113.0, we've moved to a scheme where we have the 112, the even numbered minor releases are, are maintenance releases. Those are the usual releases that you've always seen. We maintain binary compatibility across the maintenance releases. They have a stable file format. But what we're doing now is we're actually sending interim releases as we prepare for the new maintenance releases out as released products where they go through our release process. Um, the features uh, may change, the file format may change, API calls can change. Uh, we may drop features if it turns out they're not performing well or ready for prime time. But it's really so that interested users can try out new features as we prepare for the, the next maintenance release. So we get them in a finished enough formats where they can go through our release process successfully. So they're not buggy. This is experimental doesn't mean buggy and crash prone. It just means that we're trying out new features. And there's a blog post that we created for this some time ago that, that, that um, has some clarity on this. So the virtual object layer, the original architecture that we had for the library is you have this, this public API and then underneath it, you have you know, there's there's non-storage calls that deal with in-memory things like data spaces and property lists. But then there's also storage-oriented calls, calls like H5F create, H5D create, things that create, create and work with files and data sets and groups and name data types. And then underneath that, there's a virtual file layer that allows you to take the the, the offset and length and buffers that that we use to write out to storage and. and and, and translate those to different types of file operations or to remap the, the logical linear address space into separate physical files as we do with like say the family virtual file driver. And so we've interest first now in starting in version 112.0, this thing called the virtual object layer. And it sits right underneath the public HDF5 API for the storage oriented API calls. And this is at a much more abstract level than the virtual file layer. It's, it's much higher up. And I'll show this in a minute how thin this is. And, and this allows you to replace basically the, the file oriented guts of the library with your own storage code. So there's two kinds of bowl connectors. There's terminal bowl connectors that map HDF5 objects to arbitrary storage schemes that are defined by you when you create your, your bowl connector. There are also pass through bowl connectors and these can perform operations such as caching and logging or handle asynchronous operations before passing the data on to the next connector in the chain because they're all stackable. So the current architecture now looks like this, where we have the, the public API, we have the virtual object layer, we have the native, we call it the native bowl connector. It's the thing that constructs the HDF5 files that everybody knows. 
and that is, that is still built into the library and basically acts as it did before. But now you can also load these plugins, like for example, the, the Deos Vol connector is one of the more mature connectors and that maps HDF5 objects to Intel's Deos storage. Uh, the async connector created by um, LBNL that allows uh, asynchronous operations on top of say the native full connector. Um, and, and this really is, it's a very thin layer. Underneath the public API, when you make a call like H5 H5F create, and you give it a file name and some flags and these two properties, the creation and access property lists, we, we, all we do inside the public API is we, we marshal these up, put them in uh, a form that we can pass onto your connector and, and invoke your, whatever callback you have, you have set up to handle this in, in, your, in your call, in your connector. And that can be anything under the hood. Um, you can map uh, file creation to, to MongoDB, to a relational database like Postgres, and you can mix and match. So it's not that you create a Volt connector that matches, maps file operations to just like some, like one type of storage. Under the hood, you can do whatever you want. You want to put your graph information, your I'm sorry, your group information in Neo4j, and then store your data set information in Azure Blob Storage. Fine, the, the, the API allows you to do that. Um, there's a toolkit repository for this. Uh, we've got a link here. Um, inside there, there's a, there's a tutorial, there's vol documentation, and we keep that up to date as we release new versions of the, the library. Um, one thing to keep in mind about the vol connectors is that you really should be targeting 113 for this. That is, the, the vol interface may change a little bit more. In fact, it will as we add in these, uh, these feature flags in the vol connector this summer. But it's generally stable in terms of the major operations that you're going to be trying to support. The, the reason that we can't support 112 is that we had to make some changes for the past few vol connectors that are, we can't backport to 112 without affecting binary compatibility. So 112 has to be dropped at the end of the year when 114 comes out. So the Onion VFD. The Onion VFD enables creating versioned HDF5 files, where version is defined by an open, write, modify data, close cycle. Um, data and metadata for the additional versions are stored in a separate onion file that, that, that is maintained separately here. So there's like, if you have the original file and then every version that you create goes in this extra file, there's only one file for all the versions. There's not one onion file for version one and one on file for version two and one for version four. Now these have to be linear. You can't open version three and then branch off of it. Um, so, th and this is not, set in stone as the only way of doing this. We, this is just the, the first implementation of this. There's This could be implemented inside the original file. You could potentially have it set up so that different versions have their own files. But this is the, the use case that we targeted for the first release of this. And there's new API calls to get um, versions out of, to, to pick which version to open when you set this up. So you could say open version three, and then you'll just open this up. And the, the way that this is handled inside is that there's, we're, Inside this onion file, we keep track of which pages of metadata belong to which versions. And then there's a bunch of indexes that are set up inside the virtual file driver that map up a request to the, the right page and then return that to the library. And we also have, we have command line tool support. So you can do H5 dump and pick different versions of it. Uh, this will be released in HDF5 1.13.2 and it's not coming to 1.12 or earlier because of incompatible VFL changes. So VFD Swimmer, uh, Swimmer is the single writer, multiple readers uh, access pattern. So in, in many cases, you may have a, a writer that is writing out data. This could be financial data. This could be scientific data that's coming from, uh, from, from an instrument like a you know, LCMS or from um, uh, if you're at like a synchrotron and you're getting diffraction data coming in, it goes into an HDF5 file. And then you have these interested readers that want to look at this and inspect the data as it's coming in to make adjustments, to just see it as it's coming in, to respond to it. And this is a problem for, for HDF5 because we have, a, we have complicated internal structure. And th so the problem that we have is state, is that when you have a writer, there's a lot of, ca there's several caches that are inside the library, such as the metadata cache and the chunk cache and things like that. And the, the state is a combination of what has been written out to the disk and what is kept in memory for the writer. And so the, the problem with this is that if, if one of these nodes, if like a, a root node is on a disk and a leaf node has not been flushed from the cache, if a reader comes in and inspects this, this root node here and then finds that there's something that it needs at a certain offset and this only exists in the writer, 
when it tries to go to this part of the file, there'll be nothing there. It'll just be garbage, or it'll try to go off the end of the file. And so that's a that's a problem. The, the, the file system is not a great way of doing, doing IPC for this reason. So Legacy Swimmer was what we had implemented before in 110.0. That relied on flush dependencies in the metadata cache. And, and that just ensured that that children were flushed before parents. So that when a reader came to inspect the uh, metadata on the disk, it, it always saw a consistent state. Maybe not 100% up to date with respect to the writer, but the file was always consistent. But this was a limited implementation. It wasn't implemented, implemented for, for all operations. It was really just for data set appends. You can't create new file objects. There was no variable length type support. And there's a high maintenance cost to this because Swimmer pervades the metadata cache code. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a high metadata cost and there's potentially a performance penalty for having these some of these structures maintained. So there's a new implementation of this that's going to be released in 1.13.2. And this uses external temporary metadata files. It's implemented at the VFL layer. Like Legacy Swimmer, the file is always consistent, but not necessarily 100% to date with respect to the writer. The guarantees are tighter, assuming that your file system can keep up with VFT Swimmer. And it works with almost all HDF5 operations. And there's lower maintenance costs because it's restricted to a smaller part of the library than the, the, the previous feature. So this will be released in HDF5 1.13.2. It's not coming to 1.12 or earlier due to incompatible VFL changes. And Legacy Swimmer will remain in place for now and, and probably will for the foreseeable future because people rely on that. And that's going to be harder to um, And plus, it's, it's also it's a big feature to, to remove from the library. So another thing is that now that we're going to be delivering a, the, these many features that we've been working on for the Exascale Computing Project and these new VFDs, once, once that's released in HDF5 114 at the end of the year, we're starting to ask ourselves, well, what, what are we going to do going forward? What do we want to do with the library? HDF5 is a, is a 25 year old code base that has been, it's been managed pretty conservatively. So we've kept a lot of things around. And we've tried to not change the API too much, but not all the choices that have been made in the past have been good ones. Um, so we'd like to have a rethink and try to fix what is broken and what causes people pain. Currently, this is just in the planning stages. So we're just getting started with this. Um, everything that you see in these next couple of slides is of course, you're very forward looking. We have no idea what we're actually gonna have the ability to, to do and what the, the community really wants to do going forward. And my intention is not to rework the API in a way that makes it difficult to move applications to whatever we decide is going to be the new API. We just want to fix some of the stuff that causes those problems. And so I have, I have a list. Um, there's, there's, there's some things that one of the, the key things that people ask for is semantic versioning. And that, that I feel like that is really important. We really need to, to get that in there. But there's also, there's a lot of API improvements. We should really remove deprecated functions. Um, we should probably change our, our function signatures to return HRT all the time. So we don't throw away half of a type's space so that we can return negative one as the bad value. Um, so there's some renaming that I think new people find confusing, like sec2 makes sense to almost nobody to rename it to POSIX. So there's a bunch of small things that we want to go in there. And it, it's unclear what sorts of resources we'll have for larger things. One of the things I'd really like to, to get changed is improving variable length storage. I'd really like to fix that problem soon because that causes people a lot of um, a lot of problems. But but of course, resources are always difficult to come by because these are usually unfunded mandates. But one of the things that we're trying to do is we're, is we're trying to be uh, better about participating in the open source community. And so I've, I've created a forum post on this. So if you have ideas about what you think um, you want to see in, in HDF5 2.0, then, then please go there and comment on it and tell us uh, what sorts of things you would like to see in the library. And, and, and as we try to figure this out together, what, what sorts of changes people would like to make, we'll also be looking to see what sorts of, like what sort of support from the community we can get in terms of development. So who wants to help actually develop these features? So I also have in this slide here, for anybody who wants to download them, there's a bunch of references. I have the, the links to the, um, the current RFCs for all the features that we work on the, the final documentation for this. And then there's some video links on here. So if you want to see that, for example, the Onion VFD demonstration, there's a, we, we did a, a demo for um, uh, a couple months ago for that. And there's a, a bowl constructor tutorial that shows you how to make a, a toy bowl connector from, from scratch. So any questions? Yeah, thanks, Dana. So any questions?
I just want to clarify that the vaults that Dana mentioned, it's, it's really where um, the community can step in and start developing for their own particular needs. It's not something that AG Group is going to develop uh, deliberately for every single thing. So that's where uh, those who say, I wish HDF5 could write to this thing or that thing or work with that or this, well then, you know, sharpen your C programming language skills and, uh, you know, in easy 7,000 lines of code, you can get what you want. You know. Um, so thanks. Uh, Dana started early, so I didn't come to say to welcome you to the HDF session at ESIP. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, to remind every speaker that we have 15 minutes, Dana was right on the dot. I'm impressed. That I was watching. Say. I was watching that little clock tick down over there. And I was like, I, right I am like impressed, 14, Dana. I am truly impressed. So um, next up, if there are no more questions, um, uh, next up is uh, Joey, uh, who is here. So I don't know what changes. I guess we stopped sharing, or Dana stopped sharing. Yeah, I stopped sharing. Or I we just share over. Okay, and then we find his right, how it works. Yeah, guys, all right, take care. Take care. So Jolie is going to uh, continue. Joe, you have 15 minutes like everyone else. Which one are you, Joe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jolie, yes. Do you need speaker notes? No. Slideshow. You look good on Zoom. That's good. Hey. Hi, my name is Joe Lee from HDF Group, and I'm a software engineer. Yeah, today I'm going to talk about accessing cloud data and services using Earth Data Login, PyDev, and MATLAB. If you are not familiar with the Earth Data Login, EDL, this is a single sign-on solution for user registration and profile management for all US DIS system components and data services. So if you want to access data, you need to sign on. If you want to use a service like OpenDev, you also need to sign on. NASA provides so many data tools and services, and our main focus is, yeah, data that's on cloud, Amazon Web Service in S3, and the service is OpenDev. If you're not familiar with OpenDev, it's an open source project for network data access protocol. And my goal is to help users to access S3 data and open that service by providing code examples on website called hdfus.org that I maintain. Through the website, some users encounter the problems. For example, I can now access HDF5 on S3 using MATLAB HDF5 API. And one user asked, Oh, I cannot read data from OpenDev server using PyDev client. So these kind of questions are very interesting to me. So I investigate further. So PyDev solution was quite simple because all you have to do is provide two URLs. Typically, OpenDev requires a single URL to access data at the bottom. You put the data DAG name and open that service and then data file name. But it doesn't work as is anymore because EDL. So what you have to do is add one other URL that authenticates with your EDL username and password, then get the, some cookie value and then stick in your PyDEP code. Then you can access the data. As for the solution for MATLAB users, this is a little bit harder because you need to get a temporary AWS token 
using Earth data login credentials, and you have to get it from the their website. So after you get the token from AWS, you have to copy and paste to the MATLAB code. Then you also need to run MATLAB EC2 instance on US West to region to access data on S3. So this, yeah, MATLAB provides a EC2 instance you can launch right away. So it's, yeah, you need to, you need to have a MATLAB license and then you can use that cloud service. We put together the solutions in complete examples. So if you are more interested in high-depth solution and MATLAB solution, you can visit our website and they provide a complete code. As, of, as far as I know, they are working well, unless or they log in changes something. <laughs> And there are some limitation. Yeah, PyDev works really well, but MATLAB has some limitation. For example, S3 token, yeah, yeah, S3, data on S3, token is valid for one hour. And I suspected it was imposed by NASA USDIS, but it was not. They say this is a limit imposed by AWS because of role chaining. So if your job involves a lot of data in cloud and may take longer than an hour, yeah, you may have some issue. And many users like Nested API, however, MATLAB supports H5 API better in terms of S3 access. And so NSF API users, yeah, you cannot access data. Sorry. <laughs> so here are some possible solutions. You see cloud is very good at scaling up and either horizontally or vertically. So all you have to do is run multiple MATLAB instances in parallel and use the same token and code. Yeah, another possibility is you yeah, you can write your own code to regenerate after one hour. So for, I never tried this. So if somebody knows how to do it, yeah, please, yeah, yeah, send that code to me and I'll post on our website. And MATLAB is aware of that this API doesn't work for S3 access. However, you know, that's it for data they are essentially HA5. So you can use HA5 API instead, as long as it's in DSA4, not DSA3. And you can keep asking MathWorks to support S3 access through the nested API directly. We already asked, but the more community asks, yeah, they will implement much quicker. And that's it for my two tips for this year. And do you have any question or comments? If not, thanks for coming and listening. And hope this, these tips help your earth science research. Thank you. All right, uh, any questions? All right. No. So through the generous donation of Joe's, I think we got gained eight minutes or something. So we we shall uh, generously use them for something good. Uh, next up, I think, is James. If I'm following what I wrote <laughs> on that schedule, schedule. Uh, do I just start the? Oh, the slide. So no presenter. Oh no. Thank you. And then, how this set up professional audio? Yeah, click that thing. Yeah, then get the X.
Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. All right, James. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Wow, oh, thanks. Thanks, Alex. Um, okay, so what I'm going to talk about is um, serving data from S3. So um, before I get going, I want to thank um, uh, NASA Raytheon for you know supporting this work and supporting my presence at this meeting. Um, and I also want to thank all the folks in OpenDAP and the folks at HDF that have helped to make all this stuff possible. So, um, and also before I get going in this, a lot of times when I give these talks, I, I talk a lot about underlying technology and how we implement it. And then that's because I want people to understand what's going on inside the software. Even though all our software is open source, the reality is source code can be sort of impenetrable right especially when it's you know c plus plus everybody goes oh my god that's so hard that's so hard um but um but this is not that kind of talk okay this is a talk about um how you actually use this stuff so now i'm going to attempt to advance the thingy and how do i do that oh i Oh, I've done a bad thing, haven't I? Just, I think, yeah. Okay, sweet. Okay, so what can you do? So what is this really about? Okay, so what we have enabled in Hyrax over the past, you know, so it's actually quite a bit of time. We've been working on this on, off and on for about five or six years, but we want to be able to serve existing files in a web object store like S3. We don't want to have to alter those files. We don't have to reformat them so that they're cloud optimized in any way. And that's not because I think that cloud optimized stuff is like bad or anything. It's just that there's so much existing data. That we want to have a technology that enables this like lift and shift stuff with all of its, you know, all of its drawbacks. We still want to be able to do that if, if that's really needed. So this is about a technique that enables you to do that. And it works for HDF5, which means it also works for NetCDF4, right? Because they're synonymous. And it would actually technically work for anything else that uses HDF5 under the hood, right? So that includes MATLAB files and actually a bunch of other things. Because one of the things, I'm not sure if we've if, if this is broad knowledge, but HDF5 is an underpinning layer for a lot of different commercial formats as well as open source formats. So, okay, so that's the, that's, the, that's the what you can do. And so what you need to know about um, using Hyrax to access these kinds of data in this particular way, that is directly from S3. Um, and, and so the, the server, um, you need to know where the server is gonna run, okay? Just as a pragmatic step, you need to know where the server is going to run. And then you need to know where you're going to store some ancillary metadata files that the server needs. So let's take a quick step back and think about um, the underlying mechanism here. So we have these HDF5 files and we stuck them on S3. And in general, you can only do one thing with S3 as far as read them, and that's to grab the whole thing. But the reality is HTTP evolved from its initial implementation with that single um, accessing technique get and said, well, you know, you can actually get a range of bytes. And this, the magic of byte range reading is what Hyrax uses to subsample data that when it's stored on S3 without pulling the entire file out of S3. And so that's really what we're going to do here. But what we need to know, what we need to have is a map into the HDF5 file that tells us where various pieces of information are. And what we want to do is we want to build that map and store it in a single blob so that we can pull it from somewhere and operate on on that blob really quickly we want to be able to look up all these things really fast and then when we get down to the point of saying okay now i want to read the sea surface temperature variable or i want to read the latitude and longitude variables for like a level two swap data we want to be able to go in there and grab the little chunks that are inside the hdf5 file and pull them into our memory leaving all the other stuff in there now another thing you kind of need to know about is that these HDF5 files, they oftentimes have 100, 200, 600, 1,000 variables. They have a lot of information in them when NASA produces them. So, so 
being able to be able to go in there and get just a portion of them out is a potential real big savings. The metadata file that I'm talking about, the thing that holds the map that tells you where all the stuff is, they're not really that big. They're orders of magnitude smaller than the data file, many orders of magnitude in most cases. But they do provide this interior map. And so we also need to know when we're setting all this stuff up, we need to know the URLs of the data files we want to serve. Okay, so I spent a lot of time kind of talking over um, the middle point here. But again, the three things that you need to know in order to set this up, where the server is going to run, where you're going to store that ancillary metadata that gives you the map into the data file, and the URLs of the data files you want to serve. And so then, so how do you, so, so this talk is really about how you make those ancillary files. And so we have a particular command line tool. It's creatively called get DMRPP. That's like a user friendly um, thing that you can all feel warm and cuddly about. But anyways, but what it means is data set metadata response, actually, that's actually the R stands for response. Um, and then plus plus, we augmented it. We augmented the standard open app data set metadata response object with a little bit more information and that more information is this offset and counting and also information about all of the myriad chunks that hdf5 uses to store data and so and that's all about like compression and things like that okay so um if you just want to use the default settings try that and see if it gets you the kind of information you need so then you can customize the configuration of DMR++ so that it will, um, it will alter that metadata object a little bit, making the file look a little bit different. And that may be important if you want a file that does not follow the CF conventions to appear as if it does follow the conventions. So some interesting things that get DMR++ can do, it can say, you know, you've told me you want this to be CF compliant, but these data, they don't actually have the latitude and longitude information in the file like CF wants. Would you like me to generate that extra information and store it somewhere for you? Yes, that would be good. And so you can tell it to do that. And then the other thing is that uh, in addition to customizing the configuration, if that's what you want or need, you can write a script to process a bunch of these files all at once. Because you know that NASA collections have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of files. And each one of those files is a separate URL, right? So you're going to have to do this a bunch of times. So you don't want to type it all on my hand. Okay, so to get and run DMRPP, the easiest way, by far the easiest way, is to get the Hyrax server Docker container. And actually, can you tell me how much time I have left? You're a great seven more. Okay, so um, so you can get a higher, you can get a Docker container. Okay, and this is by far the easiest way. And I'm going to show you how to some tricks about running the Docker container in just a second. But you start the container. And it contains the Hyrax data server and the get DMR++ command, boom, all in there. And this, by the way, is actually the standard distribution that we're running inside the NASA cloud. And you can run it on your own machine. It's, it's, it's full featured. Docker is amazing. But anyways, okay. And so then in order to build these ancillary files, you run get DMRPP and you use a recipe. And the recipe is on this slide. And um, so, Here's what you do. You, you type in all this exciting stuff. And so I'm going to, I'm just going to kind of run through it. But you say, you know, Docker run and, and you give a host name. And I use the long names for all of these, um, you know, all of these options so that it's a little more, you can understand what's going on a bit better. But essentially what you're really doing here is you're mapping a particular directory wherever you, wherever you hold the information onto this directory inside the Docker container called user share Hyrax. And that's what that volume thing does. That enables you to map something on the computer where you're running Docker to the virtual computer that the Docker container represents. And then you notice that we pass in as environment variables the, the secret sauce of the AWS access key and an AWS secret access key. And come back to that in a minute in a minute okay and then you say you know the name is hyrax that's the name of the container and then the container name opened app slash hyrax snapshot so now i'll tell you 
that OpenDAP as sort of a policy, when we make these Docker containers, we push them to Docker Hub as publicly available things. That's where all of our release goes. Our CI CD pipeline goes chugga, 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 chugga. Ka-chunk. And so when we, whenever time we push something to the master branch of the Hyrax server source code, we make ultimately, well, it's successful. We make a new Docker container and that Docker container is publicly available. And that's what you're gonna get when you say Hyrax colon snapshot. It's the absolute latest thing. Now there's another thing, and it's very confusing. It's Hyrax colon latest. And that's actually the latest release, which is potentially up to about four months old. Okay, so, so there you go. So snapshot's the absolute latest thing, the bleeding edge. Um, and then latest is the latest public release. Um, but you're actually, but by doing this, by saying open dab Hyrax, I'm pointing at my screen and you can't really see what I'm pointing at, but I, I try to point over there, but it's hard for me to do that and talk into the microphone at the same time. Um, open dab slash Hyrax colon snapshot, that actually goes to Docker Hub and pulls the container if you don't have it. Okay. And so if you're on something that's not like an Intel processor, like the new Apple Silicon M1, if you add this platform Linux slash AMD 64, um, it'll actually work. <laughs> Otherwise, it won't work. Okay, so here's some sort of continued stuff. So now you want to actually use this get DMR++ command inside the container. So you do the first thing. And again, I wrote out the, inter, you know, a lot of people say it's dash IT. Um, what does that mean? Well, it actually means it's the interactive option and the TTY option, which is a blast from the past. And, um, and you say the name Hyrax and you say bin bash. And, and what you get is you get a little shell, you get a little terminal window. And so now you can run these things. And the other thing is um, another line is like a, a sort of a, a longer version of it. You can say, okay, start up the, start up the shell, but have it do something for me and just like run the command. Um, either way, the, the thing below the word where there that's the command that you want to run. And, um, and so what this is telling, what this is telling get DMRPP to do is to work in the current working directory. That's what dash B stands for. B is clearly work in the current working directory. I know, I know, but whatever. And dash U says, when you build this DMR plus plus embed that thing, that HTTPS URL for your data file, um, embed that in this in this metadata object, the thing that you're going to build, and then the output. That's the name of the of the metadata object you're going to build, and then that little thing that says S3 bucket object name. That's where to get the actual data that you're going to build this metadata for. And I put that up there just so that you'll realize that in addition to things like the local file system, this can actually pull data from S3. And remember, I said before in this little configuration, I said, here's where, you, you know, the secret key and the access ID, that's why that's important because you can't get to those things if you don't have credentials to read them. Unless, of course, the bucket is, is open. If the bucket's open, well, the person who did that is probably gonna pay a lot of money, but you don't need any keys for it. Okay, so great. So here's an example. Um, and <laughs> I know it's dense. What can I say? But um, but again, you know how you run the thing, and then and this is this is this is the this is a real world example. Um, this is a thing. Cloudy Dap is a bucket that OpenDAP has. Um, I don't think y'all can read from it. I think it's protected because we're afraid that somebody will will take all of our data many 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 times, and we will have to pay for that, and then we will not have any money left. And we like to have our money. What can I say? I mean, we're a 501c3, but still, you know, we have to pay the bills. But the thing is that what this is going to do is that it's going to take the resulting DMR++ file that gets built, and it's going to push it back into that bucket. And our server knows to look for a, a, a data file and a DMR++ that have the, the, the base names matching up, it knows to do that. So it knows that if you say, hey, DMR++, go to this place and here's an S3 URL, it says, ah, okay, well, I'm gonna expect to find the matching metadata entity for it in here. So I'm gonna move that as a blob, as a single transfer, which happens nominally pretty quickly. And then I'm gonna work with that and serve the data, subsetting the data without transferring the big file. Um, 
there you go. So uh, I'm going to talk just a tiny bit about the customization. I have two more minutes. I talk a little bit about the customization. So um, the problem is that a lot of times these files are really complicated, right? They're really complicated. And we hit a lot of edge cases. So what you really want to be able to do here is you want to try it out and see if the thing you got works right. And so um, we want to look at the default output that's produced by the, by the object you just made, and then take a look at the HDF5 handler documentation and see if maybe there's some way that you can tweak the output. And so what we do is we have a bunch of keys in the, that control the behavior of the HDF5 handler and the way that it interprets the information in the HDF5 file. And so you can um, modify those keys. And the way you do that, oh, wait a second. Is that really true? Yeah, OK. You can put those keys in an optional file, and you can pass it to get DMR++ using a little command. And then in this last page, um, since I'm now out of time, um, I've and hopefully you can get access to, to the, the slide stack, but um, there's a couple of links here that tell you information on our wiki. There's a lot of information about how to build DMR++ files for things. A lot of information about the customization options for HDF5. And also, I happen to have the Docker container running on my laptop. So if you want to see this stuff happening, then um, you can talk to me after this session. I'm actually not flying back till tomorrow for a strange reason. So, you know, I'll be around. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? Um, OK, question in the front and question in the back. Hi. Hi. Um, Katie Dejwak, NASA Langley. Hi. Hi. Um, if I'm in a position where I can make that conversion from an HDF5 file to a cloud optimized format like ZAR or use this method, you know, what are the advantages or drawbacks? Well, so um, an advantage. Um, aside making me smile for using um, for using this stuff is that you don't have to reformat the data just push it up there um, a, and and so that's a disadvantage to czar is that you do have to reformat the data and in order to achieve the most optimal performance with czar you need to think about how when you reformat the data you want to change the chunk sizes um, so that's a disadvantage, I would say. Um, an advantage to Czar is that when you do that, you, you can enable um, a degree of parallelized access that may be greater than what you can achieve through a single service like, like Hyrax. There's a data a service, at least the way Hyrax is currently implemented, becomes a kind of a choke point, OK? So it really depends on the kinds of uses that you want and the level of effort that you want to spend with the, with the process. Uh, Mahabal Hegde from uh, Karadak. Uh, can I get OpenDAP as a, like a library instead of like a, a, a deployable server so that, uh, especially in cloud, you know, so that I don't have to have any like uh, egress through public internet kind of a scenario? Yes, definitely. So there's a couple of different, uh, then do you mean like a client library that can read the data? Yeah, so yes, exactly. So for example, Joe Lee talked about PyDAP. That's a great option. And what we're doing is now we're working on extending PyDAP to provide greater degree of support for some of the newer NASA data sets. Um, there are other things. The NetCDF C API can read directly from uh, from OpenDAP servers. You can feed it an OpenDAP URL and it will work. And there are other tools as well. You know, what I meant was, I mean, PyDAP, you know, I still have to provide an OpenDAP URL. Right? That's true. So instead of, you know, uh, you know uh, instead of asking why HTTPS, can I just get the library that does all the work behind the scenes? Well, that's true too. Yes, I mean, so, it's, it's all open source. So you can definitely get, the, get that software. Yes, absolutely. It's on GitHub. 
Okay. Yes, definitely. Basically, I don't want the Tomcat server, you know, the whole Absolutely. Stuff. Just call the library. Yep. So if I'm in cloud already, I don't have to go through HTTP. That's or... correct. Yes, you could do that. Definitely. Is Most it easy definitely. to do or do I have to um, be an open app expert or? Easy is a relative term, is it not? Um, I think, yeah, I think it's, I think it's. Medium. Or do I need Jim Gallagher or? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a medium, it's a medium complexity okay. task. But it's possible. It's possible. Certainly it is. All right. I think that's all the time I have. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks, James. It was an uh, excellent talk, as always. Uh, next up is uh, AGF Group's own Ken Yang, who is going to continue the OpenDEP or Hyrex server theme. Oh, sorry, Ken, are you going to share the screen? Sorry, I was hurrying up. Please. Yeah. I can I say, oh, can continue. Stop. Oh, I have to stop share. Sorry. Okay, good. I'm stop sharing. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Going to slideshow. There. Okay. Excellent. Okay. All right. So Thank my name is can, can I speak? Can, okay. Hear something. Okay. My name is Ken Yang. I'm a software engineer in the HDF group. I'm going to follow up Jim's talk to give an uh, update on HDF5 Hyrex Open Dive Handler and the performance results of a proof of concept study. Actually, we have a very long time um, uh, collaboration with OpenDAP on serving NASA HTF5 data products. Uh, the takeaway of these slides, I don't want to go to the detail, is that in 2008, uh, we implement HTF5 uh, uh, handler and to follow the CF convention. That was the James talk about the tricks here. Actually, it was quite a long time ago we did that because uh, there was a request from NASA GS Disk that want to have translate HDF5 metadata to follow CF. We actually got the funding from NASA Access to do this. And uh, immediately after the, our release that was adopted by GS Disk to serve the HDF, uh, HDF5 data uh, through Hyrex in production mode. So after that, we did a lot of uh, significant improvement and uh, there's a performance improvement, feature improvement, uh, everything uh, just gave, gave the funding we, we had is sometimes only part-time in the past years, we couldn't do much, but we just try to support as much as we can, but it's still HTF5 to that two, to that two protocol. So for those of you who are not familiar with that protocol, like HDF4 and HDF5, if you are familiar with HDF4 and HDF5, uh, that actually protocol has also have two versions. Uh, version two called DAP2 and also version four, DAP4. Uh, for DAP4, it has the HDF5 group support uh, kind of concept inside. They also add more data types, including sine 8-bit integer and 64-bit integer and compound data type, you know, HDF5 also, you know, they call structure and others uh, data types inside. Uh, so for Hyrex to serve the data to, uh, to that for, uh, the, the default way of most Hyrex handler do, they, they do is say, they actually convert from DAP2 response to DAP4 internally by using libdap APIs. So th this is a, the update since uh, year, years ago, I, I gave the update of HDF500. Uh, I'm recently, we just implemented the direct mapping from HDF5 to DAP2. So as you see that DRMR PP, the DRMR is actually DAP4. I'm, I'm sorry, I was, I was saying wrong. I, I just recently, is the mapping from HDF5 to that 4 And the output is DMR output that you see is from Jim's talk. It's called DMR PP, actually come from DMR. Uh, we, we, we add this direct mapping instead of converting uh, from that 2 to that 4 And the, the performance improved quite a bit. 
because it avoids this con uh, conversion. And more importantly, the 8-bit and the C4B integer variables are mapped to that four. Uh, I find quite some NASA HDF5 products have 8-bit integer and C4B integer variables. So rather than, so this is a big help for those uh, data products. And other than this, I also add a direct mapping from HDF5 to that four for the non-CF, we call it non-CF or default option. So the CF option is a special configuration option for the handler to follow CF convention to translate HDF5 metadata. Default option is just translate HDF, HDF5 metadata to that without following any convention. Uh, but the thing, good thing about default option is like it has this group concept built in and the depth for also has group concept. So we can um, map the uh, HDF5 group to that for group. You may ask why yeah, you cannot do this for CF option. Uh, CF add this group support in CF 1.8. Uh, why you don't do that? The reason is that they just add this CF concept in about two years ago. And you, if you see my previous slides, we did the first implementation is about more than 10 years ago. At that time, there's no uh, group concept inside both CF and that too. So we have to remove the group structure to support uh, the, the easy access of NASA HDF5 data uh, through Hyrax by like, like popular tool like Panoply or something like that. So we, 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 that's, that's the reason. Uh, and uh, we cannot really change that because there's uh, many improvement, many coding, and also it's used uh, for, by many users, uh, even uh, you know, for backward compatibility uh, reasons, we cannot do that. So the CF option of the handler still fixed to follow CF 1.7 of earlier. But the CF group support is, can be realized by this default option. Um, more thing I did is I add the next year four data model support in the HDF 500 default option. So all of a sudden, if you are NASA next year four file, if you, if you have a good metadata inside, follow CF convention, and you're using next year four, you know, and you have group inside, it can be accessed uh, easily by the default option of handler. So you on the through through mapping from HDF five to that four. So this is a this is a very useful. Um, this is very useful for the users who really want to have group hierarchy and also as well as other uh, you know the features preserved through the translation from HDF five to next year uh, to that four. Uh, lastly, I also uh, update a documentation, a comprehensive user's guide at GitHub. And uh, James mentioned a little bit, I just gave you this uh, URL, you can go and check. Uh, it gave you a lot of uh, uh, information about how can you choose default option and, uh, and uh, CF option. And there's, uh, in the course of the years I'm working on this project, I had quite a few uh, performance of feature tuning options uh, by using high-res BS keys. So this document can help you which, which key you can use for you if you are a high-res system administrator users. So this is an update for HDF5 OpenLab Handler. I'm sorry, just quick, too quick. Now I'm going to talk about the performance study. Uh, I've done. If you have any question, you can leave until the, you know, after finish this part. Um, the Hyrex provide quite a few services. Uh, this is a service pipeline by Hyrex. It, uh, it uh, can not only give you users a type output, but you can also output a file, like an SDF file. In, in fact, in fact, that, uh, in fact that this service, this pipeline is very popular by NASA, uh, you know, um, Hyrex service is, I think is maybe the most popular data pipeline that NASA use through HDF5 file, through the uh, HDF handler and Hyrex core, 
and through another module called file on SDF and generate an SDF file. Uh, this is useful because you can subset your SDF file file. Um, and you can also aggregate multiple SDF file files and you and then you use this module uh, process to generate one SDF file for like, for example, like time series uh, data. So this is quite useful, but there's one problem. Sometimes it is really slow. So it is really slow. Yeah, we, uh, what, we, what I did is uh, I did a performance study on this. On this is um, it's not, I mean, th let, let me first give you uh, some uh, uh, information. This, I found a solution to resolve this slowness of many NASA use case. But the speed up is also is quite dramatic. It's quite dramatic, but it's not with any new technologies. It's not new algorithms. It follows a simple common sense. Uh, we want to ask us a question. Are there any unnecessary steps we can remove to improve the performance just from this pipeline? And if there are some unnecessary steps, how effective can the performance be improved if we can remove those steps? And also, can this be realized? To answer this question, we have to first dive into a typical NASA SDF file file. Uh, like James mentioned, it's used compression a lot. This is a GERST uh, from a physical oceanography deck, a GERST file. If you can see that this variable called, you know, some SST, sea surface temperature, is chunked and using shuffle and uh, GZ uh, deflate compression. Uh, compression is very useful, uh, but it is, it is very costly. It is very costly. And, and back to our um, high-risk service pipeline, this is actually what happened inside the, uh, the Hyrex version. So inside IGT 500, uh, we have to use HF read API. And when you read, use HF read API, you decompress, uh, you, uh, you decompress the variables uh, value uh, to make, to, you know, to generate a, a stream of data and pass into Hyrex. And then you file out next CDF, you compress the same data again through H5 read API. And uh, basically you decompress and compress. That's happened through this uh, pipeline. So, so the obvious question here is, can we remove the compression? Can we use a uh, pass through the data instead of decompress and compress, pass through the compressed data to the final next file? Um, and uh, this is a good idea, but next, next logical question to ask is, can this idea be realized? It turns out this can be realized. This is possible. Thankfully, uh, this is uh, because HDF5, they provide uh, API called HDF5 Direct Chunk IO APIs. Uh, this API is actually pretty popular. I heard the, in the latest uh, HDF5 user group conference in Europe, somebody also talked about this, if I'm not wrong. But anyway- You have three more minutes, Kent. Yeah, I'm almost close. Uh, so we, we can use this API and we can, we have packages we need to update. Yeah, this is actually the, it's a question, a question mark point. So we have to go to HDF5 handler to read the pattern through compressed data. We have to uh, pass through the variable storage information through the, to that for uh, library, uh, that library. And then we have to write the pattern through data, compressed data through NSDF API. So we have to change all these packages, whether this is possible. As a proof of concept study, this is possible. And the way did this, I did this pretty quickly, not that, not spent quite long, but there's more details we can talk. It's only proof concept, it's not really uh, software. So we, I decided to use some testing files to check whether this can really improve your performance. What I did, I used GERST uh, and the MARI2 data and I repack the data to be one to one chunk per variable. And the only test uh, off network 
not go through the BS, uh, not go through the network, only use Hyrax BS server. And on a Linux server, uh, I measure the work clock time to output an SDF file, file without using uh, path through or with uh, the current uh, approach. And uh, a little bit information about testing file. I just uh, make sure that the testing file choose that I can cover uh, integer and the floating point. And they have typical uh, variables represented by, you know, uh, by NASA data products. So that's what I did. And finally, this is performance study results. The performance improved dramatically. In the standard way uh, for matter two, I can get achieve 30%, 30 times faster. For girls file, I can achieve about 17 times faster. So, so this is uh, the end of my talk. I, I just hope that if you are inspired by this, you know, by this talk, some way you give credit to HDF5 library by having providing this HDF5 direct chunk IO APIs, and also give credits to the HDF group. If you are application, uh, you are inspired by this removing compression, decompression uh, steps, and then you can save your, your you know, uh, save your, improve your performance. Yeah, save the cost eventually. So that's end of my talk. This is my last slide. All right. So I just want to, previous slide, Ken, just to clarify that, that those numbers are seconds. Yes, this is a through, uh, I, you know, the work clock time I see seconds over there. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah sorry. it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Thank you. But, yeah. Uh, anyway, any questions for Kent? Um, no. Yes? No. Okay. All right. Thanks, Kent. Um, you can stop sharing now. Good. So let me see. Where is this? Is this oh, the wrong one? Oh no, it's a good one. I think I'm next one. So that's that's useful. Um, and how you do full screen or sharing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But can I have this like a more bigger, like a full thing? Yeah. In Zoom, you have to share. Okay, good, excellent. I hope everyone sees. So, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, something towards cloud optimized HDFI files. And um, uh, this is not a definitive word on this topic, uh, just actually at the beginning, but um, I thought, let's see what's something possible and available right now in the HDFI library. And, uh, and I would like to, uh, so it's a nice uh, follow on from what James was talking about and generating the MR++ uh, when files are in the cloud. And also Ryan Abernathy's keynote talk when he said that creating analysis ready cloud optimized data is, is a toil. And, and hopefully, hopefully uh, this goes towards helping a little bit or reducing the toil. <clears throat> So uh, you will know, you know, especially after these five days, you, you know clearly you know, what cloud optimized and cloud native are, but I just wanted to clarify for this purpose, for the purpose of this talk, what I call cloud optimized format is really an already existing data format where the internal structures were optimized for cloud access. Um, whereas cloud native uh, is a specifically developed data format that takes advantage of distributed computing features of cloud and, uh, and the key value interface of object stores. And also for me, whenever you say cloud native, obviously it's a cloud optimized, it's sort of like by definition. And so um, at least most cases in cloud native, a, what we, we used to call one file or we'll logically think about one file um, actually consists of many objects and 
cloud native formats do allow both that data reads and data writes. In other words, you, they allow modifying those things. Um, and data reads typically access each object individually entirely. Whereas in cloud optimized, there is one file is really one object and there is no writing. You can either rewrite the whole thing or you cannot just change little pieces here and there. And also, uh, as James mentioned, the, the, the main mechanism, underlying mechanism for reading is those range gets, HTTP range gets requests somewhere into that one object. And uh, obviously, if you know where those range gets should go, um, that's what make it cloud optimized, essentially. So uh, why, and this is uh, only my feeble attempt to, uh, to create a new acronym so, you know, if you have COG for cloud optimized GeoTIFF, well, we might just have a CO HDA5 for cloud optimized HDA5. This has not been clear, cleared through our marketing department in our company. Um, so, you know, it may change, but um, hey, if you tweet and you like it, we may keep it. So, you know how that goes. Social media drives the decision making. And so, um, uh, so why why cloud optimized HDF5? Well, one reason is that obviously there's, as James said, there's a lot of HDF file, files already, and they are um, you know in archives and everything else. And so it would be really helpful, perhaps, to avoid too many reformatting or rechunking or any other operations on the files once once they are created, as they go through archives to cloud object stores and anywhere in between. Um, the other one is that already now a huge use case emerges where people um, want to get knowledge of what's in those HDF5 files. One example is DMR++, for example, and, and Cloud Optimus HDF5 um, has the potential to make that much faster than currently or make it possible while the HDF5 files are already in object stores. And the last one is that um, helps use HDF5 library to get the, that information that you want rather than using a custom developed uh, HDF5 file format readers. It's not that HDF group as a company has anything against people who write those readers. That's a great sign that the file format, HDF5 file format is open source and available to everyone and people can write readers and that's great. But they usually are very limited in their ability to read HDF5 features and then what usually happens is someone says well my reader can only support those things or my reader supports those things and make those as some other assumptions about where things are in the file so please when you generate your HDF5 file try not to use some other features of HDF5 and, and I think in the long run that doesn't really help anyone so keeping with HDF5 library really would be much helpful because then you, you benefit of someone else in solving all your problems when it comes to reading, reading HDF5. And so um, what are the properties of Cloud Optimus HDF5? Um, there are data, uh, data set chunk size. We already covered that. that it helps in that way. Optimal chunk compression, in other words, how much time um, it takes to compress versus the decompress. So in other words, how much time you storage you save by compressing your chunks, but how much time it takes to decompress them when you want to read them. And uh, minimal use of variable length data types. That really is, is very important for those who don't do, are not going to use HDF5 library to read the data. And I'll mention that why later. And also, uh, and that's the, the whole basis of this talk right now is the the cloud optimized HDF5 file should be created with file space strategy that is called page aggregation. Um, and that's not the default of the library, but I'll come to that later. So uh, large data set chunk size, you could make a talk only on this issue alone. So I'm not going to touch it much. I'm just going to mention it, that apparently people, uh, especially from the Pangeo world, they really like chunks that, you know, like a bunch of megabytes. Uh, I even heard something to 100 megabytes chunk, at which point I say, why don't you save the whole file into one chunk? Uh, but yeah, so right now it seems like bet between two and 10 megabytes. Um, however, the default uh, library's data set chunk cache, which is very important to your IO performance, especially when you create file, uh, is really set at one megabyte, which is you know way back in the time where one megabyte was a lot of stuff. 
And so, and so uh, you really have to be aware of that and change the chunk hash if you want to create larger chunks. And again, that's not something you get out of the default settings. Um, and, um, and again, as I mentioned, you really have to think about your chunk size as the compression that you use uh, is really saving so much space good if the decompression speed is, 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 or the time to decompress is larger. So that's something to think about. But as I said, chunks are almost entirely another topic for discussion. Um, variable length data types. Uh, the current implementation of how variable length data in HDFI files um, is stored is really preventing easy retrieval using HTTP range gets. And, and that means that if you can avoid variable length data types uh, in your HDFI files, then please do so. Um, usually, in my experience, is that in NASA or Earth Science data, there is very little variable length data. They are usually strings. And they typically come from, or at least uh, recently, they come from the NetCDF library. Because the NetCDF library's storing of strings, by default, creates variable length HDF5 string. And so even if you don't know, and if you, you don't want, the NetCDF library will do this for you. And so, and so this is something to really keep in mind. But again, as long as you are you know, in a small amount of things, that's fine. Uh, I don't know if things are going to change with certain machine learning training data because they, they categorize and label a bunch of stuff and they're usually some kind of uh, strings, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, but again, avoid them if possible, uh, create fixed length strings, that's best. Um, page aggregation, so what is that? Uh, it's one of the file space management strategies that is available in H by HDFI library, but is not default. Uh, bad news, you can only do it at, at file creation. It's pretty similar as chunk sizes, chunk shapes. Uh, it's, well, once you do it, it's kind of there in the file. And the existing files have to be reformatted with the H5 repack um, to change the file space strategy. It's the same thing if you would like to change the chunk shape of the, uh, in the file, you have to use the H5 repack, so it's the same thing. Um, so, what is page aggregation on a very high level? Uh, the library always reads and writes data in file pages. And so, this page aggregation strategy uh, is best suited when the file content is added once and never modified, which seems to be the case for a lot of NASA or science data. You people generate them, they're produced, off they go. And so, that I think could work in, in those cases. The, the library basically writes file metadata and the raw data, and I'll clarify what those things are, uh, in those pages. So file metadata is everything that explains where other things are in HDFI file. And the raw data is what you would call data. In other words, data sets data. And so those two things are separated in separate pages. And um, if you set up an appropriate page size, then you could achieve that essentially all file metadata information, in other words, where everything is in the file, is just in one page. And so, um, and that's the basis of this called optimized HDF5 that I'm talking about here. Oh, I have to speak faster. So, uh, HDF5 page buffering, that's, the, uh, that's the, the, the read part of the, of the HDF5 library. That's the low level library cache for the file metadata and raw data pages. They are, it's very low level, and at that point, the library still has not decided what are the chunks and everything else, but they're cached by the library in memory. However, it's only available for files that are created with page aggregation, so it cannot work on any file currently that you have. And the page buffer size must be an exact multiple of the file, file's page size, and that, Right now, it's not really clearly known. If you look at the file, you kind of have to open it for reading to get that information and then have to close it, then open again to set the page buffer size. So there's a little a negotiation communication here, but that's something that we can discuss how best to resolve. So example, I chose an ISET2 file, um, ATL03 product. Uh, it's about 2.3 gigabytes, uh, has 171 groups, has a 1001 data set, 
no connection to the Scheherazade. It just by accident, it so happened to have 1001 data set. Uh, and the file metadata size is this 7.7 .7 megabytes. Now remember this number because that's the important one. That's the entire amount of where things are in the file. It's in this 7.7 .7 megabytes somewhere in the HDFI file. And I use the H5 repack and I created two versions of the original, one with a four megabyte uh, file page size and one with eight megabytes for size. And when you create those things, actually, the, the byproduct of this, the files gets larger because now you have exactly four megabytes and megabytes and eight megabytes of pages that everything has to be aligned to. So the file increased this one, but you know, 0.18% or 0.35%, which I think it's kind of acceptable in these days. Uh, and it really went fast. I mean, even on my laptop, it was a, several seconds to repack them. So it wasn't really a huge, huge process. And so use case, uh, I put all these three files in S3, and then I chose a test that's a very common these days and applicable to both HSDS, open the DMR++ that James has talked about, and now lately the Kerchunk. Uh, so that, you know, when you want to get this information where the content in the file of HDFI file is. And I tested it using H5Py 3.7 and HDFI library, which is as Dana, at the beginning of this session mentioned is the experimental version, HDF5.1.13.1, uh, with read-only S3 virtual file driver. And that, that virtual file driver comes with the HDF5 library, and I used it because essentially, by its design right now, it's very inefficient in how it communicates with S3, and it's therefore it's going to be very sensitive to any benefit of this cloud-optimized HDF5 files. So there is no any smartness in it. So I, you know, I don't have to worry about switching off various things. So I know that you know, if I make some benefit, it's truly a good thing. And so uh, results, when those files were in S3 and I tried to list the content uh, where things are in the file, using the original, it took almost 20 minutes, 19 minutes and 11, 19 seconds to get this task. When I actually now used um, the four megabyte, maybe, yeah, four megabyte version of the file and the four megabyte page buffer size, the time went even further worse. It was 22 minutes, almost 22 and a half minutes. But here, because we are now using page buffering, we can now get uh, statistics from the live HDF5 library, what's going on. And as you can see here, basically, um, you know, there was 943 times that the library needed something that was not in the page buffer. So because page buffer was only four megabytes, it has to throw that out, get another page from the file in and get this information again. And because it was only four megabytes, the cache, and we already remembered 7.7 .7 megabytes in the, uh, in the file metadata size, the library was constantly throwing out those those pages that had file metadata information in it. So it was basically taking more time to do the work. However, if I said that the page buffer is now eight megabytes, so in other words, I have enough size in my cache to keep all the file raw me file metadata pages in it, then the time basically went down to 37 seconds. Because again, if you look at the page buffer statistics, there are no more evictions, there are no misses, is only one. So, so basically everything is in the cache, the library can proceed. It make only one request or two requests and got everything it wanted, off you go. And so that's basically like with any other cache. If you fill up cache with the right stuff, that really helps. So it's just yet another example of that, of that very well known uh, thing. And so the rest of the numbers are just different plays on things. But again, as soon as you have enough uh, page buffer cache, which is greater, equal or greater than eight megabytes, the things really work better. But anyway, it, the whole point is it will really reduce the time from the original file using this uh, page aggregation and page buffering to really make it this much more acceptable. And the next page is just the local file system to give you an idea that 
yes, those re repacked files are still usable even in a file system. Um, uh, and these are the timings. So they, obviously they're much, much less from the beginning because, you know, HDF5 library really likes the file system. But anyway, the, the point is that as far as the local file system goes, results are much closer, but not that far off from the, from the S3 results with page buffering. So we are talking about 37, you know, to 40 seconds. We're talking about, you know, 33 to four, uh, 36. So it's kind of very comparable, even for the file in the file system, which is a good result, which means that somehow we managed to make S3 kind of, you know, work, you know, for this kind of a task as your file, local file system. Uh, anyway, wrap up, I'll speak, you know, very quickly because I'm out of time. But anyway, uh, library supports this thing. These are the, the fairly little known features. So you kind of have to dig up for the, you know, documentation what to do it. We'll make more noise about it as this year goes by uh, next year. Uh, we plan to extend these studies and make more into data reading as well, not just uh, this test that I so showed and, and see how it goes. And um, uh, page buffer statistics is available, so you can actually see uh, it's all supported in H5Py already, so you can actually use it from Python. You have to write C code for these kind of things. And um, this is work in progress, and uh, we really would like to involve the ESIP community, especially our SDIS partners, uh, in trying, trying out these things, uh, connecting with us, and providing information. Thank you. Yes. Uh, any questions? So, you kind of told us um, for like an application test, that you use the source, right? Yeah, you have to run the mic. Oh, thank you. So, if you're, if you're trying to write an application that was going to run in an environment and be looking at files like this, would you want it to go and somehow interrogate? I don't know how you can find out how much the total size of the metadata for a, a new HDF5 file is and then close it, tell the page buffer to be at least that big, and then reopen it? I mean, is that how you would write an application to make it work well? Um, yes, when you start creating a file, obviously you don't know how it's going to be, but I think um, you could write a couple of sample files because you always have some test files and sample files that you create when you're evaluating products. And uh, I think the file metadata size would probably impact it by the, the structure of the content that you have, so in other words, what's in the chunks doesn't matter. But for example, I mean, matters the number of chunks or, or something like that. So once you, once you zero in on what your product file content and organization is going to be, then I think you could run a command that uh, it's called the h5stat, there's a command line that can give you that information and then you can probably use it. Uh, and then your plus minus sometime you know, you have some freedom because you, as you see, I, I had 7.7 .7 megabytes. I chose eight megabytes because that's the, that's the next size for the page. And that, that basically how I would approach it. Okay, thanks. Hi, this is Hi Leon from uh, Gutter. Uh, I know this, is, I, I noticed that one slide you said, uh, you know, the optimal chunk size is two to 10 megabytes. Yes. I know this is not the focus of the talk, but I'm just curious, like what, um, so first is that, do you mean before or after compression? And number two, like what criterion you make this uh, recommendation, like based on some benchmarking or some particular application or like some statistics, the metrics, I don't know. Uh, so the first question, yes, this is the chunk size as it would go into the file. So if you chose compression, that would be a compressed chunk. Um, the next one you said where those numbers are coming from, is that what you asked? Yes, yes. Um, right now, the, the biggest source of information for me is the Pangeo community uh, and, uh, and those who are implementing some kind of a climatological data analysis. And so uh, they, they seem to um, prefer bigger chunks. But again, uh, we did some trade studies with OpenDeb several years ago in terms of uh, you know, the transfer from S3 and everything else. And, and it basically, for the amount of time you wait for something to come from S3, you might as well ask for more bytes than, than you actually need because you're just going to be much more efficient. 
And so, and so 10, you know, like 10 megabytes or two to 10 megabytes, it kind of gives you a good performance between how much you wait before S3 start ending, sending bytes and how much time it takes to get 10 megabytes. And then if you can use those 10 megabytes for something good, then it's really beneficial. That's basically what it is. One more little thing, like for example, I have a huge uh, data set, you know, dividing two chunks, right? So the, the data entry is very um, high, which means some chunk are very, can be compressed very well and some, some chunks don't. So when you say two to 10 megabytes, are you referring to the largest chunk size or medium chunk size or what? Um, no, I mean, it, you know, you have, you know, uh, the, um, how you go about it, for example, if you're targeting something, you, you, the way how you calculate chunk size is that you have your chunk shape and then you multiply by the number of bytes of your data type. And that, that gives your chunk size. Because that, that's why I didn't talk about it. There's a chunk size and chunk shape. Chunk shape is the number of elements per dimension of the chunk. But chunk size are the bytes of that chunk. And so basically you would you, you size up in HDF5 library, you size up based on the chunk shape. Okay. But you have to think about is, okay, my chunk shape times, times the bytes of each element, that's my chunk size that I'm kind of looking at. I think I missed your answer from my first question. So, because yeah. I, I thought you, the two to 10 megabytes is after compression. Yes. So, uh, okay, it's after. Well, I mean, you say, you, you target, let's say five megabytes. So the compression will give you less yeah. than five megabytes of data. Yeah. But in the worst case, you end up with five megabyte chunk size. Okay, I kind of got it, thank you. All right. Any more questions? Any any comments or anything from the audience, uh, virtual audience? Nothing. They're silent. Okay. Uh, no, no. I can I, I can uh, comment on your on the last question. May I? Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, this is Eliana Formula. Uh, so uh, just one thing to remember is that HDF five when it does I/O request, it reads the whole chunk, compressed chunk or compressed whatever is stored. So really, I/O request will depends on the size of the chunk and the file. The beauty of page buffering and page delocation that you do not need to worry about uh, if you kind of uh, chunks will be compressed and uh, compressed chunks if they fit in the page you get advantage first of uh, reading uh, having big IO and with S3 it will be important to get all and you will have information already in um, buffer cache. So the point is that you want to choose your page sizes and chunk sizes and experiment with compression to fit as many chunks in one page, or at least one chunk in uh, one chunk in in the page. And this is important to experiment and see. So there is no uh, really recipe what will be the good chunk. Just remember the principles that HD5 reads. If it's not page allocated, it reads by chunk. Um, a, ch a chunk will be the whole IO request or by pages. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right, thanks. I'll stop sharing now. Um, we have one more, uh, one our own John Reedy. So John, please start sharing. So how much time uh, will I have? Uh, you have 15 minutes. All right, let me find the sharing button. Huh. Um, yeah, I got it. All right. Oh, uh, we, we see something. Yeah, good. <laughs> it's progress. Where is it? All right. How's that? Yes, good. Okay. All right, go. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm John Reedy. Uh, enjoyed the talk so far this morning. Uh, so I'm going to talk about HSDS and specifically performance features of HSDS. So uh, many of you have heard me talk about HSDS before, but I'll give a brief overview for those who are not familiar. Then I want to talk about some new features, uh, streaming support, fancy indexing, 
and then look at uh, some performance comparisons and case studies. So let's get into it. So the idea of designing HF for the cloud is to create a RESTful API. And secondly, to utilize object storage. Uh, I think we've heard a lot about S3. It's really become the predominant way to store, to store large uh, data files uh, in the cloud. Uh, and then thirdly, this idea of elastic compute. If we can take advantage of scalable compute, that's a very powerful concept. And lastly, compatibility to let you use your existing HDF applications with the service in the cloud, just like we'd use files on desktop. So in HSDS, we have a schema that uh, is sort of like DMR++ in that you have uh, each object has a metadata stored as JSON, and then the data set chunks can be stored either as separate S3 objects, or if you're mapping to an HDF5 file, you just store the location of that chunk and then use the S3 range get mechanism to fetch the chunk as needed. So when we have a, a data set, say these dark lines are the chunks, each of these chunks gets stored as either a separate object or a separate uh, basically position within an HF5 file. And then the data set metadata, the type, shape, attributes are all stored in a different object as JSON. Um, James was talking about containers and, and we use containers to the nth degree in HSDS. So to be scalable, we enable a variable number of containers and there's two types, service node and data node containers. The data node containers map to a virtual partition of your S3 store. And the service node containers are the ones that receive client requests. And then the service node containers multiplex to the data node containers. So one request will land on say one service node, but that service node may send hundreds of requests to, to dozens of data nodes. And then those data nodes are all busy reading or writing to S3. Uh, so these are different sort of features. Uh, the REST API, read write support, multi-reader, multi-writer, um, and a cache, which we'll talk about later. And the idea then is as we increase the number of these nodes, we'll get better performance. And the containers can either be on one machine of Docker or on mobile machines with Kubernetes. Um, for compatibility, we have H5PyD, which is a Python client that's based upon H5Py. So the same API, but rather than talk to library, it invokes REST requests to the server. And there's some extensions to H5Py for features that are available in the server, but aren't yet uh, available in the library. So uh, to deploy HSCS, there's a few different ways, right? Um, and these have evolved over the years. So Docker is nice if you are satisfied to have all your containers run on a single machine. If your needs extend beyond one machine, you can create a Kubernetes cluster and then deploy what are called pods uh, to the cluster. Uh, then we have AWS Lambda, which is a new thing. In Lambda, there's no server. You just invoke these functions dynamically using AWS Lambda uh, service. And then finally, there's H5PyD Direct. H5PyD Direct is um, setting a server. Um, and I think someone Jemma was asking about this to James uh, if you're using Hyrex. It's kind of like this in that your H5PyD application dynamically creates sub processes that serve as a server for the lifespan of that file open. So you don't need to set up a server, but you have your client directly accessing the storage. So here's some graphical depictions. On Docker, you have an EC2 instance, let's say, a bunch of DN containers, you can figure that, one SN container, uh, the DNs are all talking to uh, the S3 bucket, and you can have either 
internal clients talking local hosts or external clients they're mapping to a DNS host name. On Kubernetes, it looks like this. Um, so a Kubernetes pod is the minimal deployable unit uh, on Kubernetes. And in our setup, each pod will have one SN, one DN container. So you create a deployment and then there's like this magic dial. You can say, I want one pod, I want 10 pods, I want hundred pods. And Kubernetes uh, will find a way to instantiate those pods on any machine in the cluster. There's an alternative way of saying your pods where you can have uh, each pod has one SN, some number of DN containers and an application container. And here where your application would be your custom application. And then you deploy this pod, uh, the application just needs to talk to this SN container, which will always be on the same machine and the SN will talk to the DNs then on the same machine. And the advantage here is that you can kind of have this flexible scaling, right? As you add more pods to add more throughput to your application, you don't need to worry about uh, scaling HSDS in parallel with that, right? It just naturally scales because every unit of your application pod has the, the HSDS uh, containers as well. And then we have Lambda. Uh, in Lambda, you can either have external clients that are talking through a Amazon API gateway, and that gateway invokes Lambda functions that talk to storage. So in this case, the external clients don't even know they're talking to Lambda. Um, it just looks like the normal HSDS endpoint to them. Alternatively, you can have H5 PyD clients that are invoking Lambda uh, directly. Uh, they just use a specific uh, external endpoint uh, when they start, and that works as well. Uh, this is great in that you have no server set up. You can have thousands of simultaneous Lambda invocations. Uh, the bad news is that Lambda has a fairly heavy startup cost, like two seconds. So depending upon your application, it could be uh, not uh, very performant. And then H5PyD Direct, again, you have your application in just as during file open, it instantiates these sub-processes. And once they're instantiated, it works much like the server talking, VMs talking to the storage system. Uh, if you're wondering when you use Lambda, it's uh, here's a chart that kind of illustrates how fast it is to spin up either new containers or, or new Lambda functions. If you have say EKS uh, running uh, on EC2, which is this line, you see if we need to spin up new pods, at a certain point, there'll be this delay, a few minutes, because that's what's required for new hosts to be instantiated, uh, to be a place for these new pods to be located. In contrast, the Lambda function, you know how to see it, it's like a vertical bar here, right? You can invoke thousands of Lambda functions almost instantly. So it's really good if your uh, scaling needs are very dynamic. Okay, uh, next, let's talk about streaming support. So uh, before, if you made a request to the service to say, read a selection that spans thousands of chunks, it would tell you it's, it's too large. Uh, please try again with some selection that spans fewer chunks. Uh, and there's very reason for this uh, in terms of limitation. Uh, but now we support what we're calling streaming support. And that means that when I make a request that spans say thousands of chunks, rather than trying to instantiate all that data at once, the service will kind of paginate through them. And so that means as you send a request, the server will start gathering the data. As that data is assembled, it'll come back to the client. Meanwhile, the server will still be paginating through the remaining chunks in that selection. 
So this is very nice in that you can have requests that span gigabytes of data. And yet we control the memory load on the server. Uh, another new feature that has a performance impact is fancy indexing. So here's an example of the syntax um, for fancy indexing. I might say I want a selection which is in the first dimension 0 through 100, but in the second dimension is a some selection of coordinates. I could uh, do this one by one, right, make four selections, but with this fancy indexing feature, you get a big performance boost, uh, about eight times performance of iterating through the columns. And here you can see how this uh, performance scales with the number of nodes in HSDS. So four nodes, this test case took 65 seconds, eight nodes, 35 seconds, and 16 nodes, 23 seconds. So almost linear scaling. Uh, next, uh, let me show you how this compares with some of the other methods we've heard about today. Uh, so my test case will be this uh, 17,000 by 2 million size data set. So it's an 80 gigabyte file, 40,000 chunks. And we're going to do a selection where we're reading one column out of that data set. So each read is going to access 10 gigabytes of data from S3, our, our disk. And so we're going to pair HFI library with spinning disk, HFI library with SSD, HFI library with the S3 VFD driver and HSDS with different number of HSDS nodes. And voila, here's the results. So for the spinning disk with HDF5 library, this test took 59 seconds. I contrast that to the second line where we have SSD drives. Uh, that's four seconds. And the third line we have using the VFD driver with the data on S3, and that's 400 seconds. Uh, so it's inclusion always use SSD? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, SSD, first there's this cost aspect. So an SSD drive will cost 10 cents per gigabyte per month versus say a, a spinning drive, which is less than half that versus S3, which is on maybe 20% of that cost. Secondly, the thing about these drives is that you have to allocate your drive beforehand. So if you need more data, you'll need to recreate a new drive with larger capacity. And secondly, that drive can only be attached to one instance at a time. So that's why through the course of this, this, this meetings, we've heard S3 talk a lot because it's just become the way because you store once in S3 and anyone anywhere can access it. Anyway, so finally, uh, for HSDS, we do this with one node, two node, four node, eight nodes, and we have uh, times of 109 seconds, 67, 42, 34. So with more nodes, we actually get to a point that's roughly comparable with the HF5 spinning drive access, uh, and, and way faster than with the VFD. We're not uh, anywhere near. SSD, so uh, you can't compete there. Uh, but for many use cases, uh, HSDS will be a good solution. Uh, one more thing is HSDS caching. So I mentioned that- One more minute. OK, I'll try to talk fast. Uh, VM containers have a chunk cache. Uh, so Alexander mentioned how the default chunk cache in the library is one megabyte. Uh, in HSDS, it's configurable, and uh, you can set it to be multi-gigabytes. And furthermore, that cache is shared by all applications. So I set this up uh, with a four-system uh, cluster, 50 HSDS pods, and each VN container had a two-gigabyte chunk cache, which gave us a chunk cache of 100 gigabytes. And then I ran the same test case, uh, 100 iterations, and I, I compiled the times. So you see here in the first few iterations, uh, the run times were more than 30 seconds. But as we run, and the, and the test case, it would randomly select a column uh, for every iteration. And so 
as time progressed more and more often, it would find that the data is actually already in the chunk cache. So you see our average latencies uh, went down to around 20 seconds uh, after a few runs of this. Okay, and finally, uh, HDF Lab. Uh, this is available on the HF group. I ask people to give it a try. Uh, it's a very easy way to test out HSDS and H5IP. And uh, I have some case studies, but in the interest of time, I will get past those and some links. All right, All right. that's Thanks, it. John. Yes, any, any questions? Uh, yes. And I think for those who forego early access to lunch to stay longer, <clears throat> go. Hey, John, how are you? Yeah. Uh, it's Good. James. Um, so oh, James Gallagher from Open Dapp, since there's other people online. So I noticed about the, the Lambda, um, you said that there are some drawbacks to Lambda, but you didn't touch the very last bullet. Um, and it said that Lambda functions can only return JSON responses and only accept JSON as inputs. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Right, right. So in the, the Lambda, you send the Lambda request as a space in private. So for you know, read operations, it's pretty easy to encode you know, say your hyperslab selection as a JSON. The response uh, is also a JSON. And you can hex encode uh, your response as one of the JSON items uh, but that's obviously, you know, a, a little slower uh, compared to kind of like a binary response. Uh, what can you do? John, can you be closer to the mic? It's kind of your audio sometimes is get stronger or weaker and it's a little problem of understanding. Okay. Yeah, I'm saying, uh, yeah, so Lambda requires uh, the request responses be encapsulated in JSON. So that, that's kind of a, a performance handicap. <laughs> yeah, kind of. That's too bad. Um, okay, well, thanks very much. Thanks. All right. So that concludes it. Thanks to everyone who came. Thanks to the presenters. Thanks to the ECIP, uh, how you, they call them, the uh, fellows. Yes, sorry, my bad. So the fellows who helped all this run smoothly in closing the doors to reduce the noise. So uh, see you next year, next summer in Burlington, Vermont, you know, uh, stay healthy, stay safe and uh, see you around. Thank you.